Spoken History, if you've not been here before with us tonight, uh, is a collaborative effort of Northwood County Historical Society, the Marshfield Historic Preservation Association, the City of Marshfield Historic Preservation Committee, the Marshfield Area Genealogy Group, and the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library. And I am Natalie Cruz, and I work here at the Everett Rail Marshfield Public Library, and I'll be facilitating this. Um, don't have a big part in this. Our speaker tonight has a lot of information that she's excited to share. And her name is Carol Crazen, and she's the granddaughter-in-law of Gus Crazen. And she's going to be talking to us tonight about the many um, buildings and homes designed or built by Gus Crazen and family. So Carol, if you're ready on your end, I think we're all okay technically, and we've got a lot of people joining online. And you go ahead and take it away. Okay. <laughs> I haven't prepared a presentation like this for a very long time since my college days, many, many years ago, and never on PowerPoint. Actually, I used a manual typewriter. So please be patient and sympathetic. This information is as correct as we have been able to verify, though there still could be some errors due to address changes and misunderstood information. We are still trying to locate and confirm many prints, newspaper articles, and hearsay. Any corrections or clarifications are greatly appreciated. There we go. This history of Marshfield is about the life and accomplishments of Gus A. Crayson. There we go. Gus as a young man. Whoops, <laughs> Gus pictured with his siblings. He is on the right. And the Crayson family. They immigrated to the United States in 1892 when Gus was seven years old. They lived in Arkansas for just a few years and then moved to St. Joseph, Michigan and finally settled in Tigerton, Wisconsin on a family farm. In 1904, at 19 years old, Gus began to follow the carpentry trade. In 1907, while living in Tigerton, he and his brother Jacob began a construction business, Crayson Brothers Construction. November 10th, 1909, Elsa Fremming of Norrie, Wisconsin became Gus's wife. This is his family, Elsa and sons Lawrence and Carlton. In 2011, Ken Crayson, my husband, was searching the name Crayson on the internet. He was surprised when he discovered that his grandfather, Gus A. Crayson, had designed 12 buildings listed on the Wisconsin, quote, architecture and history inventory. Ken was living in Chicago in 1951 when his grandfather, Gus A. Crayson, who lived in Marshfield, passed away. Due to the distance, they only occasionally saw each other. Ken knew his grandfather was an architect <clears throat> and built his own home, but that was all the six-year-old knew. How surprising and exciting it was to learn, even so many years later, that his grandfather Crayson had designed and built beautiful buildings listed on the architecture and history inventory. According to the intensive survey report of 2005, quote, Gus A. Crayson was the only professional architect to practice in Marshfield in the first half of the 20th century, unquote. Gus had been designing before 1907 when Gus and his brother Jacob started the Crayson Brothers Construction Company in Tigerton. In 1918, Gus became a licensed architect when he grandfathered in after proving he had been des designing for years. His brother Fred and William were also carpenters and they all worked together. After the depression in the 1930s, his brother William became owner operator of the Marshfield Construction Company. This is a photo that was taken while the Adler Theater uh, was being built. They all had a part in building more, more modern Marshfield. This research has been done by Gus's grandson, Ken Crayson, and me, Carol Crayson. Seven of the 12 of the architecture and history inventory are in Marshfield, and seven are still here. They are in order of build. Number one and the oldest recorded so far in 1914, the Hamilton and Catherine Rodis home 
at 1108 East 4th Street was designed by Gus in the Dutch colonial revival style. With its portico <clears throat> and beautiful screen side porch, elegant living room and dining room, and a rare wood paneling, beautiful uh, dining room with rare wood panels, beautifully glass enclosed bookshelves on the first floor office, a telephone closet, five bedrooms on the second floor and two on the third floor, three baths and a large third floor ballroom. It is exquisite even a hundred years after it was designed and built, lovely now as it was then. <clears throat> this is the second on the architecture and history inventory built in 1926. The first Marshfield Clinic. Doctors began organizing at 301 South Central in the Thiel building. Renovations were made to the existing building. This well-designed floor plan is from 1917, and it shows offices for doctors and examining rooms and uh, waiting rooms and all sorts of wonderful things for doctors. The first building was officially built as the clinic was built at 620 South Central and was opened for business in 1926. The halls were lit with skylights and decorated with artwork. We knew this was an important Marshfield building. We had pictures of it when it was new, but we couldn't find the structure even when we stood on the corner of 7th and Central. Additions next to the 1926 clinic building were added in 1958, just three stories, and in 1961, a fourth story, and in 1965, three more stories, a total of seven stories, to accommodate the growing need. 30 physicians offered 13 different specializations to provide better medical care. In 1989, the original two-story clinic and additional seven-story addition and additional seven stories became the Marshfield City Hall. But for me, it was only after several visits to Marshfield that I discovered the original skeletal structure was still there at the Northwest corner of 7th and Central but it had been sided, gutted, and is now an indoor tennis court inside the city hall. You can't even imagine my disappointment. <laughs> this is the third listed, 1935. The Marshfield Industrial Foundation is better known as Weinbrenner Shoe Factory. This 1935 project was designed by Gus Crayson, funded by the Federal Emergency Relief Administration and was built by Marshfield Construction, owned by William Crayson, Gus's brother. The original building, which is easy to find at 205 West 3rd Street, occupied an entire city block and surrounded an interior courtyard. But after World War II, demand grew and the factory expanded to fill the open area. This building has had seven additions, all designed by Gus. Marshfield still rents this building to Weinbrenner for $1 a year, as it has since 1935. This is the fourth, 1936. Gus designed and built his home at 808 Oak in international style. A flat roof, two-story stucco building with aluminum frame windows. It was an unusual design for its time and it has had several changes over the years. The second story porch was enclosed to make a larger master bedroom. Um, and the roof was changed to a pitch roof. Ken remembers its beautiful wooden front door with a protruding garage. It is still a private residence, but we were given access to the interior when it was listed for sale a few years ago. As Ken remembered, the home was, home was built of reinforced concrete, both floors. It had aluminum frame windows with safety glass which Ken remembers was a problem when Gus was locked out and he couldn't break a window. To get out. <laughs> it had beautiful semi-exotic hardwoods in the interior, which is probably due to Gus's connection with Mr. Hamilton Rodis or Mr. Connor. It is awesome. The fifth was built in 1937. Whoop. Okay. The Adler Theater was built in 1937 at 419 South Central. Gus was the on-site architect. It was built by Marshfield Construction. 
It was the first air conditioned theater in Marshfield and was elaborately decorated in Art Deco style. It featured the latest projection equipment, luxurious carpeting, and an ultra modern lighting system. Adler Theater leads, quote, Adler Theater leads the Midwest with its 10 love seats, mm -hmm. double sized with no armrests separating the occupants for lovebirds and patrons who scale 250 pounds and up, unquote. <laughs> this is also well documented as it has a site file at the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison. It is now the Rogers Theater. This is the sixth. Um, in 1941, the armory at 201 South Oak was designed in 1941 in Mediterranean Revival style, built with $52,000 of Works Progress Administration funding, WPA. It has a solid cement drill floor. It served as an armory for 54 years. Currently, it's known as the Oak Avenue Community Center, and it is used for special community occasions, craft shows, basketball, volleyball, pickleball, <laughs> voting and can be rented for special large family gatherings. It is still as beautiful as the day it was finished. The WDLB radio station building at 1714 North Central was built in 1947 in the Art Deco style. The original building is semi-hidden by stores which were built around it. Though it is still very visible on the west and the North Side, WDLB 1450 AM has continuously been broadcast from the original building and in 1966 was joined by 106.5 FM. Look for a tall antenna when you are shopping on North Central. After finding out about the architecture history inventory structures, our search began to locate other structures that Grandpa Gus remodeled, designed and built. In May of 2011, I attended a very informative and helpful genealogy workshop in Marshfield. <clears throat> I spent a week researching in Marshfield at the library and continuing on the internet. On the internet, there was a newspaper wedding announcement connecting Doug O'Donnell to Gus Crayson. Doug would be employed after his wedding by architect Gus Crayson. I was lucky to find out that Doug O'Donnell was listed in the phone book and still resided in Marshfield in 2011. I contacted Doug before I left Marshfield and learned that he had worked with Gus during the end of the 1940s and until Gus passed in 1951. The next time Ken and I were in Marshfield, we met with Doug. <clears throat> he had many original prints of structures that were designed by Gus, as well as some that were redesigned and renovated. Doug was very generous about allowing us to take pictures of any and all prints and advise his family to give us prints when he no longer needed them which we received a few years later after he passed. The prints are priceless and awesome and were instrumental in our search. Doug O'Donnell was a very special friend and precious link into Grandpa Gus's designs as well. And it still cracks me up because he was so special. However, at the time those prints were made, the corner identification plate only included the name of the building or purchaser, city and date, but no street address. So our statewide search research continued at the Marshfield Library on Microfish, the Wisconsin Historical Society in Madison, newspaper.com, chatting with whoever might have information, even driving to towns in Wisconsin, some of which are thriving and have grown and some no longer functioning or even there. As well as designing and building in Marshfield, Gus designed and or built structures in 119 other towns, cities and burgs in Wisconsin. We have had help identifying some structures from Don Crayson, a nephew of Gus's, as well as Lori Bellagio, Ruth Voss, and many others along the way. We really appreciate the encouragement and guidance from Don and Vicki Schnitzler, priceless. Gus and his brother Jake were carpenters, as well as having the Crayson Brothers Construction firm from 1907 to 1932. They were very proud and advertised well their desire to help uh, anything in construction. They were very conscientious of their reputation. According to a newspaper article in January of 1917, they quote, opened a much needed paint store and added wallpaper later. This is a picture of the inside of their paint store with Gus on the left. 
the items they advertised are no longer common products. Calcimine mm -hmm. in various shades, pit Karen for kitchen floors. And they were very proud of their new cement mixer. How paint stores have changed in the last 100 years. Gush and Jake were even fur entrepreneurs. A couple of years ago, Vicki Schnitzler received a call from a man in New York who found some information at a Salvation Army resale store about the fur farm business that Gus and Jake were involved in. He had certificates and other information. His research led him to Vicki and she knew to give us a call. This information was saved from extinction through his find and his realizing that this would be of value to someone. Networking is important and unbelievable. Brother, brothers Fred and William, Bill, were also carpenters. Bill's son, Don Crayson, resided in Marshfield until his passing last year. Cousin Don Crayson, actually I think two years ago. Cousin Don Crayson had toured us around Marshfield and showed us buildings that Crayson's built and even ones Don had worked on. Patricia Nenning, Sandy Bump, Terry, Has, Harto, and Jim Shaw, as well as Don's daughter, Donnell Anderson, are cousins and grandchildren of Bill Crayson, so Crayson descendants still reside in Marshfield. I don't mean to slight the other cousins, but you're not Marshfield residents. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> There's a hurdle for firm certificate. See, I needed my husband to do this. Um, Marshfield to Pittsville to Grand Rapids. Gus was involved as an alderman with city government and also with county government for years. As someone who doesn't live in but travels to Marshfield, I felt his involvement with road inv improvement was important. So worth noting, Gus was instrumental in having the roads paved from Marshfield to Pittsville to Grand Rapids in April of 1917 with a $2,000 amount to be paid by Marshfield. He was also very inventive. And in 1913, he invented an automatic open and closed gates for a freight elevator for H.C. Koenig. We have no other reference to H.C. Koenig or where this building house, housing this freight elevator, uh, freight elevator is. Any leads would be greatly appreciated. Here are some of the more memorable and noteworthy buildings most are still standing. The Blodgett McCready Cold Storage Warehouse, if I'm correct with this, was still was first reported Marshfield contract award to the Crayson Brothers in August of 1909 by C.E. Blodgett. The Marshfield newspaper reported on September 30th, 1909 that the Crayson Brothers were relocating their permanent residence from Tigerton to Marshfield. Jake's first home in Marshfield, although this is an updated photograph, and Gus's first home. And the building and designing continued in Marshfield as well as locations in the northern part of the state. We know they worked earlier in Athens and Norrie, according to a Marshfield Times 1922, uh, September 22, 1909 article about the Blodgett McCready Cheese Warehouse. Gus and Jake had also done work in Colby, Owens, Dorchester, and other towns along the Sioux line. They relocated their residence to Marshfield to be near the prospect of a wealth of design and carpentry work. This was a time in Marshfield after the Upham fire for renovating and rebuilding Marshfield with quote, modern unquote techniques like basements, using central heating systems, and even indoor plumbing. Many of their original rehab updates projects were done over a hundred years ago and are still surviving. <clears throat> in the early years, much of their design and construction work was done for C.E. Blodgett, who was well known in Marshfield for hotels and cheese and refrigerated buildings. Gus designed and the Crayson brothers did the construction for the canopy over the Blodgett Hotel, formerly the Tremont Hotel. They did work for the Blodgett Hotel Annex, the Bodega, the Juno Hotel Canopy, and the Marshfield Grocer Company at Central and First Streets. Most are no longer there. They did build a barn for the Blodgett family located on Highway H. Mr. Blodgett owned several farms and raised prize cattle. And I'm not sure this is the right farm, but we think it is. 
But thanks to Doug O'Donnell, we have original prints showing the 1925 design by Gus, which was built by Crayson Brothers of C.E. Blodgett's Hotel Charles. 168172 South Central. I am sure you're all familiar with this 97 year old building on Central. They also did the large addition to the building in 1928. It was a grand hotel in the 1920s and still not only functioning, but amazingly beautiful for a building almost 100 years old. In their beginning in Marshville, they also began a railroad connection. Gus designed and the Crayson brothers constructed the Western Express office at the Sioux Depot in 1910, 25 feet by 50 feet, made of brick, quote, with a fine front of Bedford stone with a total cost of $2,000, end quote. This picture I found, someone put it on Facebook for North Woods and it says Sioux Depot. This I got about a week ago, static. 1911, the Chicago Northwestern Railroad Station Depot was located at 751 South Central. Pillars Hardware bought the building in 1996 and the depot reached the end of its line. But it was thought to have been designed by Grandpa Gus and built by Crayson's. However, I have no official verification. I'm still looking though. Normington Business Block. The laundry was initially built in 1909. We don't have proof that Crayson's had anything to do with this part of the laundry except the style is just like Gus did then. Newspaper articles didn't always give full disclosure. In the beginning of the 1900s, we discovered the name Crayson was not well known before 1911 and was often misspelled when given accounts of what they did. However, because of a newspaper article in the Marshfield News, September 9, 1915, page four, Crayson Construction built the two story um, 40 by 64 foot addition, which had laundry on the first floor and two flats on the second floor. What was that located? Um, six, yeah, fifth, I'm gonna say six in Central. Thank you. Uh, 1913, Grayson Brothers did a brick addition to the concrete foundation for the city's light and power company with a cost of $1,600. In 1922, Gus was secured to draw the plans up for the Marshfield Water Electric Light and Power Company for a new 500 horsepower boiler house with coal bunker, which was added to the pumping station at the plant, as well as a 150 foot brick smokestack. Grayson Brothers were given contract to do the work. This was located at the end of Central Avenue on the side of the lower pond at Wildwood Park. It was raised in 1998. My question is how do you build a 150 foot chimney out of brick? <laughs> <laughs> in 1913, I guess so. Gus had an extensive um, connection with the Rodices. He not only designed the Hamilton Rodice house, but we have prints which showed that Gus also designed. In addition to the office building, that the Hamilton Rodice house, in addition to the main building, regulations over by a dry kiln and factory, two story office building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But unknown to many and true hidden and a true hidden surprise are the Rodas employee homes built in 1946. Not sure these are actually the ones pictured because changes have made to men, been made to many of them. They are located in a section of the city, which was called Hungry Hollow, which is on the east side of the tracks across from the Rodas plant. Gus drew three designs for homes, small, It's not going. Technical difficulty. There we go. That was small and now medium and large. These were offered by Rodis to Rodis's, thank you, upper level employees with no down payment. Many homes are still there. Rodis sold to Weyerhaeuser in, 19, in the 1960s. The Marshfield Brick Company on Man Road was established by Lewis Hartle and built by the Crayson Brothers in 1915. Gus Crayson and Ernest, Car Ernest Krauss 
also became co-owners of the brick company. In its day, it had 60 acres, five kilns with drying space and even boarding houses for employees. I have a picture of the first brick, but I, it's too hard to show you. The first order was for St. John's Catholic Church. 1918, they began making, quote, fancy brick, unquote, of brown to chocolate and moss faced brick with rough faced finish. The junior high school ordered the brown brick. Other buildings using Marshville brick are Columbus High School, the former Adler Theater, which is now the Rogers Theater, the brick barns of Old Norwood, and the Oak Street Armory, to mention a few. Stock in the business was offered, which sold out quickly. The brickyard closed during, during World War II because of a moratorium on building. Most of these should be familiar in town. Grayson Brothers replaced the building for Felker Brothers at 22 North Central after a fire in 1915. It was 75 feet by 123 feet. They also built other structures in 1916, 1922, 1946, and 1947. Oops, I hit the wrong thing. There we go. During 1916, at Fourth and South Maple, Crayson Brothers constructed a garage for Paul Pirwitz. It was a 48 feet by 88 feet one story brick with a stone foundation, partial basement, and steel trusses for the roof. Wagner Pritz Hurwitz Company sold Nash, Chevrolet, and Rio. It has just been remodeled at the corner of Fourth and Maple. Many of the auto shops have enjoyed this building over the years. We wish the new remodel a successful business there. It's now up for rent. In 1917, Crayson Brothers built the Sam Miller Fruit Company cold storage plant at 169 North Central, quote, with service to the public, end quote, at a cost of $200,000. Work began before September 4th, 1919, and was completed by March 1st, 1920. The Miller Fruit and Cold Storage Warehouse became the consumer store on North Central and Arnold Streets in 1925. Same building is now the St. Vincent de Paul at 169 North Central. In November of 1907, Marshfield Bank was organized. It wasn't until 11 years later in 1918, the Marshfield Bank building at, five, at 252 South Central was built. It is 36 feet by 82 feet. This significant corner anchor building is the only remaining bank building structure in Marshfield. The bank was on the first floor, rental offices on the second floor. There was a major fire in January of 1922, destroying the interior. The Cloverland City Bank, State Bank, incorporated in October of 1922, took over the burned building. They remodeled and operated there until December of 1932 when it closed. Marshfield Bible Center and Rural Bible Crusaders occupied it from 1949 until about 1962. Various businesses have and still do operate there, though they also have space for rent. 1919, the first junior high school built in Wisconsin was built by the Crayson Brothers at 305 South Chestnut, the Hattiesburg corner. November 11th, 1920, the Purdy School was dedicated to a local soldier who died in World War II. Whoops, World War I. It was constructed of Marshfield Bricks, quote, rough texture face brick of dark copper brown color trimmed with Bedford stone, while the roof will be of composition material on a concrete slab. There will be reinforced concrete floors throughout all finished in wood except those in the corridors, halls, and toilets, which will be finished in cement. The stairs will be reinforced concrete with ornamental iron railings, end quote. The addition was built in 1926-27 on Chestnut and Fourth. Though some changes have been made, it is still, it is 101 years old and still in use as an assisted living facility, the Angeles Retirement Community. How appropriate. Uh, the Aster? Aster? Yeah. Oh, excuse me. I looked at their sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. The Aster. Okay. In 1920, <laughs> architects Carpenter and Weldon designed the new fairgrounds grandstand. 
A contract for 18,500 was awarded to the Crayson brothers to remake the grandstand of, quote, steel and concrete with airplane, airplane style roof and seating for about 4,000 people, 66 feet by 200 feet, end quote. The contract included that the, quote, bandstand and exhibition stand be built from the lumber in the present grandstand, unquote. According to a newspaper article, September 10, 1920, it was, quote, one of the largest and most modern in the state, unquote. This afternoon, practically, oh, quote, this afternoon, practically all businesses in the city will be suspended to permit everyone to attend the fair, unquote. The grandstand area has had many uses to observe horse races and later cars ran around the baseball field. In 1925, the exhibition building at Fairgrounds, 513 East 17th Street, Gus Crayson designed for $12,000. Gus Crayson design, and for $12,000, A. F. A. Fellhofer built a two story high building with open beam construction with domestic art displayed on all four wooden facades. It had large windows along the upper side walls, which were replaced in 2015 with vinyl covered wood windows. This building serves the fair and city festivities during the year. A great example of changes in the fronts of buildings. The Marshfield Auto Electric was built at 426 South Central in 1920. In 1921, it became the minor Peel Automobiles, Automobile Building and advertised as dealers in, quote, Dodge Brothers Motor Cars, Stewart Motor Trucks, unquote. Had a capacity for 20 cars. Quote, the first floor short store front glass display space, main store entrance and apartment entrance and garage bay for automobiles, unquote. In 1946, it was advertised as auto electric service. Quote, it is the only first generation auto garage still on Central. Unquote. Though this looks like a Crayson design that has been updated with huge, beautiful windows, there is no proof yet that this was designed by Gus Crayson or built by Crayson Brothers. It's just a neat building which looks like his design. Can anybody help? In 1921, Gus designed the parsonage at St. Joseph Hospital for Sisters of Mother Sister Boniface for $20,000. This two story structure was 38 feet by 32 feet with 10 rooms and hot water heating system. And it's south, it is south of the hospital facing St. Joseph Street. It later became Marshfield Clinic's Stenographic and Graphic Arts Department. It was for a time a private dwelling of the First Presbyterian Church of Marshfield. <clears throat> June 6, 1989, it became the Ronald McDonald House with some modern construction requirements met so that they could have all the requirements hit, made. 1922, the Blum Brothers Box Company at 137 West 9th Street, the Miller's Brothers Warehouse on West 9th Street sold to the Blum Brothers was converted by Gus and expansion of warehouse was done by Crayson Brothers. Building built on the West End and the North side of the Miller Brothers Warehouse on 9th Street. The Blum Brothers decided to meet the cheese box void, the Rodis Lumber, after Loretta's Lumber eliminated cheese box production from their output. Blum Brothers had a daily output of 3,500 tubs a day after one year and employed 75 people. They had the white ash shipped in from Tennessee and Arkansas in, Arkansas in slave lanes because the quote, butter is easily tainted, end quote. The location by two rail lines was perfect. They also had room for a separate cheese box operation. Due to a lack of demand for cheese boxes over the year, the business was liquidated in June of 1972. The property was then turned, turned sold to Modern Marshfield, a furniture manufacturer. Modern uh, Marshfield Furniture continues to operate at that location even today. The warehouse at 113 West 9th Street was the Wisconsin Butter Tub company sold the building to Mall Furniture, who is currently operating there. In 1928, the Penny's store was built for C.E. Blodgett at 222 South Central. Penny's with a facelift before they moved north on Central. 
the Wood County Highway Department garage addition at 405 515 West 2nd Street was built around 1925. Gus may have designed the original. We don't have proof of that, but we know he designed it when it was enlarged in 1935 with a contemporary style brick clad addition, and that is still functioning. <coughs> Perhaps a little known, but worth recognition for sure, is the 1935 design by Gus for the Wood County North Park, nine miles south of Marshfield. The Yellow River was dammed up with a 170 foot dam, 16 feet high to create three little bulges in the bend or three little lakes. Quote, there would be a gently sloping bathing beach and a suspension footbridge across the lake. At the dam will be a swimming pool with a shallow bathing beach and a sand sunning beach, end quote. A drive across Puff Creek will lead you to a pavilion and natural woods park. The area is comprised of 160 acres in Richfield. The county furnished the land. The financing for clearing land was provided by federal funds. And I just read this morning in one of the Marshfield magazines that it also has camping with electricity. Powers Bluff Park in Arpen, another Woods County Park was designed in 1935. It was it's a winter sports park with a hard sandstone building, 80 feet by 80 feet, two stories, large room on the west end of the first story for general services room for skiers with a large heater at one end. The other end is a shop and power room for the ski toll unit. The second story is a large room open with a fireplace at either end for warming winter sports enthusiasts. <clears throat> the crew, Radke Building at 333 South Central was established in 1932. This location was only one door removed from its new 44 foot by 157 foot home at 337 South Central in 1941. Gus designed and Marshfield Construction built the new supermarket for $20,500. The new structure had four times the previous space, adding departments, a self-service food market, a modern checking system to avoid unnecessary delays in checking out, 50 feet of meat counter, restrooms, and a fountain for customers' convenience. Also an apartment, uh, also a department store handle. No, that's wrong. Also a, an appliance store handled by CW Mittens with a complete line of stoves, refrigerators, washing machines, radios, and other modern household convenience conveniences. The basement had refrigerated storage and a one and a quarter ton electric elevator to move merchandise from delivery vans directly into the basement. The second floor was arranged for office quarters. In 1950, the office was remodeled by Gus. Currently, it's the Sher Sherwin-Williams store. In 1941, Weber Grocery was built at 355 West Cent uh, South Central, designed by Gus and constructed by Marshfield Construction for $80,000. It replaced the farmer's economy store. Weber's supermarket opened February 1942. It boasted many conveniences, self-service, frozen food, checkout counters, fresh bakery, smokehouse, and most interesting is excavation under 4th Street, which allowed for 500 frozen food blockers for rent. There was also a meat kitchen where customers could slide their beef and hogs downstairs through a hole in the sidewalk on 4th Street. Other businesses that were a part of the building in 1942 were Modern Beauty Shop and Barber Shop, having entrances, entrances from 4th Street. Upstairs offices included office for dentists, lawyers, and a chiropractor. For a phone call I had with Mr. Weber sometime early 2012, who was one of the sons, he stated that Gus was able to obtain the steel beam needed for construction, just as steel was being stocked for military use for World War II. Otherwise, the building would not have been built until after the war. It currently is reopening as a Mexican grocery store. Yeah, I think when I have the building, that was the last building that was constructed with steel beams before the war. And that's why construction stopped it for a while. The lady said this is the last building that was done before the war because of the steel um, needed for the war. <clears throat> okay, um, we had we had little about what Gus did during the World War II years. There was a moratorium against building. 
But this article told us that Gus returned from Harding, Nebraska after a year while he was working on the construction of a United States Navy depot. And then he returned to Omaha for a position in a bomber plant on September 17, 1943. In June, on June 5th, 1945, an ad was placed. It stated that Gus had returned from Omaha, Nebraska and was reopening his architectural office in Marshfield. In 1947, Cardinal Mantle Apartments, and excuse this picture because I was taken from my car just before the was torn down. On North Central, <clears throat> quote, one of the first of the 288 FHA aided multiple units deals closed in Wisconsin to help alleviate the housing shortage after World War II, unquote. These apartments were, quote, far from slapdash flats as temporary expedients. These apartments would have private telephones rather than public access pay phones in the hallway, speaking tubes to the front door to, uh, to communicate with visitors, and as a security feature, an electric lock release from apartment to the front door, end quote. Due to the amount of units, a modified sewer plan was proposed. Unfortunately, these buildings have all been raised. In 1947, Rolo, Rolo Holmes Motor Coach was at 1515 North Central. It's worth noting, to help with the housing shortage after World War II, Elmer Fry built a trailer in the family barn. It sold quickly and he received requests for more. So Elmer, his brother Roland, Harold and Norman, and his brother-in-law John started manufacturing trailer coaches in a 14 by 100 foot Quonset, which was the beginning of Rolo Homes in 1947. After the first two years, more than 60,000 units had been sold, and it was the fastest growing firm in Marshfield in the 1950s. This is no longer around, but certainly worth mentioning. <clears throat> August 20th of 1951, relocation of the office building for Connor Lumber and Land Company was at West, West 4th Street and Central, moved to 108 West 4th. The Legion Hall was sold on October 17th, 1950. It was moved back on the lot and raised one story to accommodate a garage. The Connors building, which was uh, original architect was J.H. Heffers in 1903, was on Central and was moved down, down 2nd Street and turned to face the street. So they moved this building on logs and whatever else they had to move it down the street to get to the new location. Sears building was built at the where the Connors building had been and was connected to the Connors building with a second story bridge to accommodate the alley traffic. <clears throat> the Connors building was renovated and also had stairways to accommodate the various height differences between the Connors building and the American Legion Hall. The Connors building is the only surviving building associated with the city's early lumbering industry. July 20th, 1951, Emanuel Lutheran Parish Hall on South Chestnut and West 7th Streets. 108 feet by 52 feet concrete block, brick face structure, no basement, 30 feet high at the peak, was dedicated on February 24th, 1952. We have also done research on structures designed by Gus A. Crayson in the northern half of Wisconsin. He designed and and his designs and buildings are located in 119 cities and towns beyond Marshfield, but those will have to wait for another time. Mm -hmm. Gus A. Crayson passed away after a massive heart attack on December 11th, 1951, after a lifetime designing and building amazing structures. If you'll give me a few seconds, I wanna to switch to the homes that he built in Marshfield. Now, how do I get to that? Did I put it on here? Oops. <laughs> you have it still? Mm, device? On my device. Skip that. 
Okay, hang in there. We just need one minute to do this. Can't get this thing. Mm -hmm. I think while you're doing that, can I ask you a couple of questions, Carol? Sure. We have a question um, from Kim Kruger. She says, I'm working at the Ronald McDonald House just now. When did you say it was built? <laughs> <laughs> it was, um, I have to look it up. Okay. This is what we want. She also says, thank you. We've got a couple other comments here. Just one second. Um, Barb Barkoviak says this program was a completely new aspect of Marshfield history and its buildings and what a huge contributions the Crazens made. Thank you for new insight into our community. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I won't be able to find it right now. Right? I can't believe they had. Excuse me. So it, was originally, it was originally built in 1921 as okay. a personage okay thank and you and then switched to ronald mcdonald in 1989 okay i don't know when they had time to do anything else i i can't i am stunned by the enormity of how many buildings there are well we've done research on in marshfield uh, uh we just counted my husband just counted up how many we have information on and there's 202 buildings that were either built by Grace and Brothers, renovated, designed, and built by, and, and had something to do with Gus Grayson, or Bill Grayson, or Jay Grayson. Wow. <laughs> the family was very involved. Very That's involved. amazing. That's amazing. And I, I just have to comment too, Carol, you can sure tell that this is a labor of love that you're doing too for your family. It's really coming through. That's a lot of research that takes a long, long time and a lot of effort. Well, the rest of the state is next if my husband will. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a joint venture, huh? <laughs> he likes to travel. He doesn't like the researching, <laughs> but we're having fun doing it. Well, it, it shows that you're, you're, you've done a lot of work. I'm sorry I'm making so many errors. It's just- You're not, it, you're doing one. <laughs> We're getting there. Give me a minute here. I have a, a commenting question. Sure. I'm the granddaughter of um, William Grace. And um, he also said he never had a male name, but people would get angry when I was filling out forms because he wouldn't fill in the middle name for him. So he just started putting A. <laughs> as his, just as a middle initial. And I know his dad is Gus A. Crazen, and I was wondering if it was the same kind of thing. Gus's middle name was Elvin. So I don't, I, I may have been some file somewhere. <laughs> and if I find out, I'll let you know. <laughs> but I don't know right now. That's a whole nother thing. The family genealogy is another thing. <laughs> you know, as a kid, like, what do you mean you didn't have a middle name? Everyone has a middle name. Well, you have to understand he was one of nine or 12 children they might have forgotten that at that point <laughs> i think he was i think he was the youngest of, yeah. of them all he was and I, he was born in russia and if he had to wait before he could come over yeah. because he was yeah, big enough to go on the boat the rest came over here and then him and his mother came over after grandpa was a couple years old really that we didn't know we didn't know that grandpa that bill came over later with his yeah. mother because he was too young to come. He was too young to come. Oh, that's interesting. Where in Russia was Gus born? Volnaya. Who? Volnaya, Yugos. Ukraine. Ukraine. They were from the Ukraine. So what nationality does Germans he have? From Germans from Russia. Was he the one that paid the family tree and found out that it was with the Russian or the Germans named Bertha? He was the one. <laughs> Grandpa, Grandpa Gus, we were told, did extensive research on the family name. And he came to a part that he didn't like. We're not sure what, but we have found a few things that he might not have liked. 
And he burned it and wouldn't let everybody know what it was. But we have found out that there is a Krasin who was buried in the Kremlin wall because of being involved with communism. There's also a Krasin or two icebreaker. There's also a Krasin, it used to be, I think, I don't know if it's still around, a Krasin tour boat down the one of the Russian rivers. Um, and there's a street in, I don't remember which town now, but has a, the name of the street is Krasin. Well, if you go on uh, Google and say Krasin buried in the Kremlin wall, it gives all, all the history and everything that he had, the one that's buried there, how he was an ambassador and how I think they had a couple of funerals for him and like thousands of people came and he wasn't that old when he died. But they figured somehow, I don't know if Uncle Donnie told us this or what, that they thought he was poisoned or something. Hmm. My sister was over there and saw the sensor work. They found out that she was a prison. They treated her special. Really? And they also said if we go to Russia and say we're relatives of the Proceeds, that there was the Proceeds, that we would be elevated in her things. That's okay. Stay here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we all set? Natalie, you can hear us, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. I think, yeah, we're okay. to keep going then. This is a second section that we have with um, the homes <laughs> that either Gus um, built or renovated or whatever. So here we go. This is the first one. It's um, Mr. Felker's home. It was done in 1911, and um, they, the Crayson the Brothers construction built the house, um, and the Connors Lumber was the one who supplied the lumber. Gus didn't have anything to do with designing that. Oops, yes. Um, Kitty Corner from St. John's Church. Kitty Corner from St. John's Church. I don't know, I'm from Chicago. <laughs> Fred Crayson's house was built in 1913 at, at 10.05 Cherry at a cost of $2,500. He might've had help from, from some, some friends, don't you think? Family friends. This next house is, was built by the Crayson brothers, was not built by it, was renovated. They took this house, and I'll show you a picture in a minute, raised the house one story to put in a, a mason, a stone masonry walls for a basement. And in the basement, they added a heating system and did other improvements that were modern at the time. And this is how big the house is. I didn't have a side picture, but the house is two stories that they raised for a basement. What was the address on the Hamilton? This is the Hamilton Rodis home, which we, talked about earlier. This is the home of Louis Lamel. Lemley. Oh, there you, thank you, Lemley. Um, it, was, it was redone in 1914 with putting a porch on the east and south side. And this is at 410 South Cherry. This is the home, was the home of Roy T. Bunican. Uh, it's on 112 West 4th Street. This house was built, the first story was brick sided and the second story was done in stucco. Dr. Heaton had a sleeping porch added to his house in 1914. It was 12 by 12 feet with screens and windows. This is FK Bissell's home at 212 Park Avenue. It was built in 1914. Um, H. H. Waterman was the architect, but the Crayson brothers built it. Mm -hmm. These are two. Um, J. D. J. Harney uh, in 1915 had two bungalows built on 207 Maple. I think they have been recently recited and done because they they look terrific. Yeah, they look nice. This is P. J. Schaefer's home in 1915. Supposedly it was the finest in town. It's at 312 East 3rd Street. We know the Crayson brothers built it, but I have yet to have proof that Gus designed it. In my heart, he did. 
That's another view of it. It's a gorgeous home. The Connors House at 812 West 5th Street was built in 1916 and the Crayson Brothers built this one also. Professor Otto Hellerman um, has a home on West 6th Street. It was built in 1917. Unfortunately, I couldn't find this. Um, I think it's since been raised, um, but he extended the height, the front, uh, the back of the building was extended to the, be the same height as the front, which was two stories. And then an addition was built on the east side and a furnace and heating system and other modern conveniences will be installed. And when you looked at a lot of things at this point in time, everything they were talking about, especially from the 13, 14, 16, 18, 20 in there, everyone is getting modern conveniences, whether it be heat <laughs> or water or toilets. <laughs> yeah, modern conveniences. Mr. and Mrs. Fred Hadler were on East B Street, which we think is Blodgett Street, makes sense, in 1918. And a group of carpenters erected the handsome five-room bungalow for them. And it was equipped with all the modern conveniences mm -hmm. and expected to be completed in November. And there's a picture, we believe this is the right one. Uh, it is at um, uh, 212 Blodgett, I believe it is. Although this one says, no, nah, this one says deep folks, so I'm wrong. Felix LaPointe's flats on August 8th of 1918, they were on East South Depot Street. And this was a renovation, but I'm not sure where East South Depot Street is. So I haven't been able to. It's First Street. It's First Street? Yeah. Okay. Oh, LaPointe Hotel? Oh, okay. Well, he had um, he had double decker porch put on the front of his flats. That's all I know about him. Um, Mrs. Rhodes has been a, a mystery to me. I can't figure out where her home is or was. Um, it was built in 1919 on 4th Street. She had the home. Um, they built a foundation in the lot next door, and then they moved the house to go over the foundation. But you know what, how do you find a foundation with a new house on it from 1919, it's 100 years ago? Bill Crayson's home, which you guys all know, was built in 1920. It's a one and a half story and um, I think it's still as beautiful then as it now as it was then. What was the address of it? Um, 105 South Cedar. <laughs> <laughs> Said a relative, 105 South Cedar. Uh, in 1920, there was a house built at 819 9th Street, but I haven't been able to find that one. And I, it, this looks like his, but I, I don't know if it is. And we haven't been able to figure that one out yet. This house was done for a lawyer, E.C. Poors. It's on East 2nd Street between Cedar and Cherry. And when we first looked for this, we thought it was on the corner of either Cherry or Cedar. And there those houses are lovely, but they're not quite Gus's style. And we came across this one and thought, this has to be it. And it proved, we proved it right. It was perfect. Although the ad for that read that it was um, in, in the contractor book, it said it was uh, EC Para. So the names are a problem in the beginning of the 19th century because they don't get the spellings right and it gets goofed up. This is a house that um, was on second and between second and cherry and that described that last house actually. This is a house that I don't know that he built, but it's again, um, it's a William Trudeau's house at 211 West 4th. It was built in 1922. And it just looks an awful lot like Uncle Bill's house. And I have a feeling that there's a connection, but we're still working on that one. Okay. Mr. Lloyd Felker's house at 903 West 6th Street was, was under construction in 1932 by Crayson Brothers Building, as well as the Paul Daigie home at 1010 West 5th Street in 1931. The Crayson Brothers were working on them at the same time, according to Don Crayson but the market crashed and Crayson Brothers went under 
And so the houses were left to be finished by someone else. Apparently, it was someone that Don then worked for because he remembers finishing one of the houses. <clears throat> Four. They were very busy. <laughs> and you know, what's interesting is that a lot of their building was done along, you know how Marshfield was the center of the hub of the railroads. A lot of the building was, was done along either the railroad, any of the railroad lines. So they could send their crews out to do the building and then they could get back for the weekend. Up there a lot. Yeah. There were a lot of things done further away and they would send crews for a period of time, but, but a lot of the things were done because of the railroads being done. I know we're from Green Lake, Wisconsin area and Ripon, uh, the train went through Ripon and they, they did a meat plant there and another 150 foot chimney there. That's how we knew about that. So they were all over the place. You said four brothers, it was Gus, Jacob, uh, Bill, Fred. and who else? Fred. Fred, Fred was older. Sure. Before? 808, that's Grandpa Gus's house. I know, it is. Yeah, the house was, was beautifully done. And that, that house has cement. Both floors are made of cement. The first floor is cement and the second floor. Gus was real into good construction. And um, we went through there, as I said, when the house was up for sale and it, it, it is just beautiful. And it's unbelievable. Yeah, neat house. Paul Krause's home is at, it was built in 1937 and it's at 1113 South Cedar. We were told by neighbors that Gus designed and the Crayson brothers built this. It was done almost the same time, just after Gus's house. And it's a similar type style. And it's also done in um, Marshfield brick. So we think there's a connection, but we haven't been able to make for sure that yet. It has a flat roof. Yes, yeah. The Charlestown home was built in 1945. This is a, if you can see it, part of the print. And this is what the home looks like today. The Hungry Hollow homes in 1946 were built. This was the Ferratus homes, the other side in Hungry Hollow. And we're not sure that these are the homes that were his because some of them have made major changes, but some of them have real similar features to what those plans look like. The prints look like, yeah. I think we're getting moving pictures. Uh-oh. There we go. F.C. Wolf is at 508 South Apple, and it was built in 1946. The John L. Stauber home was built in 1950 at 802 South Columbus. I talked to the grandson of this couple. He said his grandmother worked with Gus to design the house. She loved it because she had everything to everything she wanted in it. And both she and her husband lived there until the day they passed. And they just loved it. And that's the ad from or the uh, announcement for that. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Martin lived at 800 South Drake in 1950. And this is a terrible picture, but there's a ranch house behind that big tree. Mm -hmm. They own the park place for they own the Parkway stores, North Parkway stores. This is the Martin, the Martin residence. Mr. and Mrs. Harold Martin built a home in 1950. I thought I had a picture of that one, but I guess I don't. And the Tham uh, family home. Um, I'm still looking for where this is. Um, there are several Thams in the 1955 phone book and I have to get with several of them to find out if they know which house was built by Gus. Tom, oh, Tom, that's good. That'd be easier, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, 50, no, 1950. 
Oh, good. I'll look yeah. in there. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. So this was done for y'all by Ken and I. Um, he's traveled with me all over the place and put up with me being grumpy because I'm looking so much. But if you need to get a tech in touch with us, this is our information. But um, if you remember at the very beginning, I said we started this because Ken was looking for his name in the internet. And that's how we got going with all this because we found out about this initial 12 buildings. Well, I'd like to know of, I'd like to know when you go home tonight, will you search your family name and see what you can find? Never know what's gonna be there. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Carol. That was wonderful. Yeah. I do have a couple more comments here. Um, one that I forgot about here. Let me get back into it. Um, there's an Ellen Crayson, and I'm guessing she might be related. Yeah, my daughter-in-law. <laughs> Said such great pieces of family history. Yeah, everybody's just saying thank you to you. It was wonderful. I learned so much information. And, and a lot of those places that um, you were showing, um, I, they were many of my favorite homes and favorite buildings in Marshfield. And uh, I just kind of found that interesting that they all had a little bit of a connection. And now, now I think I'm going to be able to recognize them too by the different styles. Well, so. we're still looking. We have a, a lot others that, that are possibilities and um, we're looking, but I think our, our main, well, maybe my main function will be, <laughs> we'll see, um, looking through the rest of the state because we have a lot more information about that also. And, I like traveling around Wisconsin, so I think Ken will do that with me. <laughs> well, like I said. <laughs> he just said, we'll see. <laughs> uh, well, you have a lot of people rooting you on. And like I said, I can sure tell it's a labor of love for your family and, and for Marshfield, too. I mean, this is a great um, testament to how much, you know, history is with with all of these buildings. And it's it's great that you're telling their story. You know, it's it's really it needs to be said. So this Thank has been very, very enjoyable. Um, anybody have any more questions um, online or in person there for Carol? Right. Central State Bank. Yes. Further down. He's talking about the bank that I mentioned was several different banks and it moved across the street and down the street and a lot of places were that way. We also have many buildings on Central that, that Gus had something to do with. Um, my, my problem for today was how many things can I talk about and what can I tell you about? And there's so many that if I could just list things, in fact, I will show you. Oh, there's a packet somewhere here that has over 200 houses or, or items available that that Gus or the Crayson family. Here's my assistant. <laughs> I have this list and it goes, I don't know how many pages, but this tells you um, if Gus had something to do with it, I don't know if you can see this or not. If Gus had something to do with it, if the Crayson brothers had something to do with it, the day that I found something about the newspaper in the newspaper about that item, and then any other items that tell about um, Hotel Blodgett, extensive improvement front of hotel, entrance with permanent canopy, four electrolighters, electro, here's those big lights that were on the side, um, and a large, can, with large candle power. Um, there's also a Mrs. John Cole millinery store. There was alterations yes. done. Yeah. See, and so there's there's all kinds of stuff like this. There's some that were done. There were some that were done on the first, the hundredth block of of Central, but it might be a stairway was added because the building um, wasn't under code and they had to change things. So there's a lot that's been done, but. I tried to pick out some things that would be interesting to everybody and that would be recognizable. And a few things that if you have anything and any ideas about it, let me know. <laughs> From what I understand, it was beautiful. Now it's apartments and I'm... So 
So the Hotel Charles had elegant balls, dance ballroom dances, and they had very good food. I'm re I'm repeating so that people who are listening can can hear what's happening. But um, the Hotel Charles, I haven't been inside. I would love to get inside, but it's now apartments, and so it's not not readily available. And there's a lot of things that are um, we haven't been much much to both of our chagrin. We haven't been in the Adler Theater yet. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah, we have to go to that because I want to see, do they still have the love seats? You know, I mean, <laughs> there are things that you need, need to know about. And um, we'll see, we'll see one day we'll get there. We'll be back. And I, know, I, think. I know Carol is finding more because last week I gave her yes. a couple more tips of things that I found in the newspaper that were contracted by the Crazy Brothers. <laughs> well, Vicki and and uh, Don have the library will be closing in 20 minutes. All of the day's meeting room reservations are now expiring. If you're using one of our meeting rooms, please gather your things and exit the room. If you have materials you would like to borrow, please check them out now. The library will be closing in 20 minutes. Thank you. Schooling and architecture, or was this something that he was man made? We understand that he took some correspondence courses. We don't have any proof of that, but that's what we were told that he took correspondence courses. We also know that he had his nephews, um, his son Lawrence and Carl, Carl was Ken's dad, um, would do checks on buildings for him, would watch when they were around, they would check on buildings. That is, is the structure right here? Is the weight tolerances and all that sort of thing? They would check it out. There was another nephew, a Larson, who was helping him and stuff like that too. He didn't have any formal training, but he did enough buildings, designed enough buildings before 1918 that he proved that he could be an architect. And that's when they gave him the license to be an architect. But he didn't pass any tests and didn't go to college at all. But he did a good job. Thanks. Um, I know several years ago, the book called Charles was published. So you could get into a lot of the pictures, the whole pictures. Oh. I don't know if now it's here That's tomorrow morning. <laughs> I'll check that out tomorrow morning. Um, the other thing is, um, well, crazy. My, my dad was a for Mr. State Airlines, and they had um, a terminal down in Chicago. So my dad flew uh -huh. grandpa down there with a T square and a, a, a carpenter. And um, he took all the measurements yeah. and he went back to Marshfield and he built basically built a prefab um, mm -hmm. office, you know, for, for down in the Chicago terminal. Mm -hmm. And they hauled it all down. And he got really mad because, because of the union labor laws, they wouldn't let him put it together. So they had to get these um, foul world or, or union workers in, mm -hmm. and they didn't do it right, so they had to put a shim. Otherwise, everything fit perfectly. A shim. A shim. <laughs> we, we know there's a lot more that, that Bill did, but I, with looking with what Gus did, oh, yeah. We, we only got so much. Mm -hmm. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I know, I know there's, there's, yeah, they were, they were amazing, amazing people. I mean, they, when they lived in Tigerton, he used to take a horse and buggy to Wittenberg to meet my grandma. <laughs> With a horse and buggy that way. That's how they, well, that's how they and what I, what I wonder, I, I horse and buggies, I've driven from here to Tigerton. The road from here to Tigerton is so up and so down and not really gradual. We're talking pretty good ups and downs. And I, and I know we have proof that grandpa had a 1913 Cadillac. And I'm thinking they didn't have roads then. So this 1913 Cadillac was doing this raid in mud or dirt or whatever it was at the time. So the fact that they did any of this building in this period of time with with crews that they had to get places is, is just phenomenal to me. There's there were two um, churches. He did 
lots of churches, 47 churches, I think it was, 47 churches throughout the state that he, that Grandpa Gus designed. And we had, we had two uh, church bulletins and one was in English and one was in German and the churches were the same. We thought, oh, that must've been the same day dedication. Come to find out one is in one town and one is in another town. <laughs> and they were flipped of, the, the picture was flipped. And we just thought, well, they, they flipped it for the you know, second printing so they know. No, it's two totally different churches that were dedicated on the same day. And it, there's stuff that over the state that just, we run into something and <clears throat> it's just amazing. The one church we found in the middle of nowhere is in Axonia. Where is that? It's between here. It's between here and Oconomowoc. We were, we were taking, yeah, we were taking our boat to be fixed in Oconomowoc. And I said, wait, 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 that town. I know that town. Let's go there. There isn't a town. There's just this church in the middle of nowhere. And it's gorgeous. And there, where is Gus buried? Gus is buried in the cemetery here. Um, Jake is, Gus is, yeah, Lena, Lena, um, a Baron, can't think of her first name, a lot of the Craysons are, but there's a whole, uh, up in Tigerton, there's a, cem the cemetery there has, um, Julius and Juliana, who is the great grandparents, and several of their family that stayed up there is, is buried up there. They have a big, um, plot that is each corner has a marker to show that that's the Crayson plot. And there's a big cross um, monument that has Crayson name on it. And then the Craysons are all placed around that. It's, it's worth just going there to see. Tigerton? Tigerton. And if you ask anybody, they all know where the Crayson is in the cemetery. When did the family um, uh, Gus was... Gus was seven, so 1892, 92, 92, yeah, 92, they came. Grandpa would always tell you, you can go in anybody, any city you go in, and look in the telephone book, and if there's a crazy in there, you are related to it. <laughs> <laughs> because there weren't that many. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if you find one, you're related. You're related. Yeah. This might be a good place to kind of wrap things up. Same way when they came. That, that I don't know. I don't know. Russia. They came through Bremen, Germany. I know that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt here and, and uh, before the next announcement comes on, um, yeah. just a couple other things. There's so many people that are thanking you. Just take my word for it. But we got one here who's from Kim who says, so enjoyed this presentation. Thank you for all your research. When is the book coming out? <laughs> that's my daughter and she should know better okay. <laughs> well we all enjoyed it so much um i just want to let everybody know that the next spoken history will be june 9th and the program will be marshfield's early blacksmiths and the presenter will be um john berg so thank you very much carol we're all clapping for you thank you <laughs> enjoy your evening everyone Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Especially if you're going to be traveling tonight, make sure you take some stuff along to get along the way. My daughter, when is the book? Thank you so very much for being here. I was nervous.